And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Lynn Creighton to our program. Thank you for being here. Well, we always start at the beginning. So tell us a little bit about uh, you know, your early days. Where were you born? Where were you reared? What kind of family life did you have early on? I grew up in Los Angeles. I was born in Los Angeles. Um, I have four sisters. Um, we all went to the University Elementary Training School, which I think is very seminal. Um, mm. Very special school where they train teachers from UCLA. Um, and then we w went to UCLA uh, for undergraduate school. And um, in those early days, tell us a little bit about you know, what did your dad do, what did your mom do, a little bit about... My dad know. was is a, was a CPA and my mom was a school English teacher and counselor and then finally a, um, a principal. Mm -hmm. And she was a highly educated woman. Yes, I, she was. Yes. And in fact, your siblings and you all have a higher education. Yes, I have three sisters who have their doctorates. Doctorates. Yeah, that's, and two, the other two have masters. Yeah, that's uh, a lot of intellectual stimulus. Yeah, a lot of competition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about that. Let's yeah. talk about that dynamic in the household and certainly growing up and uh, in your college years and you branched off from an, you know, from intellectual pursuit, although you are an intellectual, into the visual arts. So let's talk about some of that and how did that affect you as an artist and as who a developing knows? woman? Yeah, who knows? Now, I mean, it's such, you ask a, a, a multi-layered question. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so my sisters were not sons. It's very important to understand this family dynamic of competition that grew out of a mother who was uninterested in diapers and didn't really care about um, taking care of a household and thought it was beneath her, and a father who um, you know, used his daughters as figments of his imagination to um, uh, create a place for himself in the world. Mm -hmm. This was a confusing place to be as a, as a child. And as a child, were you uh, aware of this sense of, you know, your father wanting sons and not daughters? And it wasn't something that was um, everyday conversation, but we all knew it. And mm -hmm. my mother had had three postpartum depressions when mm -hmm. she didn't produce an, a son. So that's a lot of uh, negative energy uh, floating around. And Yeah, and I think I've been battling against that. All, you know, all my life, trying to find my footing. Now, I, I had the maybe advantage of being a second child, and so it was my job, in my mind, to make sure everything came out right. So I worked hard to find a way where we were on an even keel, where everybody was doing their part and everybody was feeling comfortable. So when you decided to study art, how was that received in, in the home and by your parents and your siblings? Well, I didn't study art. <laughs> I wouldn't have studied art. And it really wasn't until later that I had, that I projected myself into what I needed my life to be. Mm -hmm. The moment when I, in graduate school, began to have to say, you know, I am going towards being an artist, mm -hmm. I had a hard time with that. Because of all this other dynamic? The, because of the degeneration of the artist in my, in mm -hmm. my family. Mm -hmm. It was, in, as, you, as you suggested, it was an intellectual family. And so, and I think it might be, that might be the reason that when I claimed myself to be an artist, I had to find a, what I considered a legitimate underpinning for my art. Mm -hmm. I couldn't just say I'm an artist. I wasn't interested in doing anything trivial. And in fact, you even shared with me as we were studying together that um, you were kind of uncomfortable with the title artist. Yeah, in graduate and school, right when I was making that decision. Mm -hmm. And in fact, your, your undergraduate degree <clears throat> is in education? It is. And you actually taught elementary school? I was trained to teach elementary school, but by the time I got to that point, I had children of my own, and I really didn't want to share myself with other people's children. And so you make a shift in your life at that point. And a little bit later than that, when mm -hmm. I got tired of changing diapers. 
hours. <laughs> and making chocolate cakes and, you know, I began to really search for what it was that was my own life. And let's talk about the dynamic of being a woman artist and the fact that, you know, many women either choose not to have children or have children and postpone their careers for a number of years. So talk about that dynamic and did you have trouble with that and struggle with that? I think you'd have to talk to my children. Ah, <laughs> you're shifting gears on me. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's true that, that uh, they were in school and um, their life was made much different because I was committing myself to some sort of search. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was unwilling. If it's time for dinner and I'm not there, well, you know what? Uh, get something out of the freezer, you know. <laughs> and they were, they were used to my being there and, and you know, and I, I really did try. I tried to keep it all together, but it was really tough. But your children turned out pretty, pretty, pretty good. good. <laughs> How many children do you have? I have three. And what do they do? Uh, my oldest son is a uh, um, colonel in the U.S. Army. He's second command in Korea right now. A West Point graduate? Yes. Mm -hmm. and my second son is a, um, an engineer, and he, he's project manager on, for instance, the Getty, the air conditioning for the Getty, the air conditioning for um, the San Jose New Civic Center. So he's done very well, too. My daughter finds all of this very difficult. And she Olive. is finally, her brothers to be such high achievers. It's very difficult for her. Uh, she is my most brilliant child, uh, but a little bit difficult getting her footing. And she's, but she is now a chiropractor in uh, Kodiak, Alaska. So there's an interesting kind of repetitive nature in your own family in that um, here are the two siblings of your own children are high intellectuals and your daughter was kind of a late bloomer in a way. Would you say that mirrors you and your siblings in some ways? Who knows? Who knows? We're getting in too deep for that, but, but I mean, <laughs> I do not know in what way I imposed on my daughter the difficulty of my childhood. And that's something that I, I haven't been able to figure out. It's possible. So as you were evolving as an artist, yeah. you were searching for yourself along the way. Yeah. Is that safe to say? That's safe to say. And what did your husband do, your former hu husband? Uh, he was a, a physician. And that marriage ended. Yep. So again, these, these major events were taking place at the same time as you were evolving as an artist. Right. I think that I had to put aside my marriage in order to travel my own path. There was something about the way that we were married that was a limitation. Um, he wanted me to make chocolate cake just the way his mother did and, and a, sort of a German potato salad. And he thought that I was going to <laughs> darn his socks right on through <laughs> Daltage. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I thought I was doing him a favor. I was darning his socks. But when I saw the vision of Daltage still darning socks, I wasn't happy. Yeah, I bet. And, and <laughs> I was going to say, did you guys even meet before the darning of the socks? <laughs> wow. There were things we didn't know about each other. Yeah, that's so interesting. But we were married for 20 years. That's a long time. So we have one of your very early pieces up on the screen. So tell us a little bit about this piece and you know, describe it. Tell everybody what we're looking at here. When I began to commit myself to being an artist, I began to look around with my camera, actually, at how nature revealed itself and how the, the forms in nature were constantly being created and recreated uh, by water, by wind, erosion, uh, growth, decay. This piece came out of that. It's called Island of Myself. And, and, and it was the, the technique of transposing what I was learning from my investigation of nature into, some, into a form. It's, it's, it's meant to reproduce the kind of uh, drying up of, of the stream bed that happens when the water is gone. And you called it Island of Myself. So there's obviously a reference to you. And what is the connection there? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't put a label on the way that I grow through my artwork. And I don't see this as a particular 
stage, but I am growing and my artwork is, is evolving. So when this appeared to be an island, it, that's what it is. Now, the way those two things, the growth that you, I do as a person and the growth of my artwork come together is more apparent to me in hindsight than, mm -hmm. it, is in, than it ever was at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not unusual as an artist, particularly in this process when you're asked to put together a retrospective of your work. So you were also a very traditional potter at one point. Right, for many years. For many years. So talk about, about some of these early years. pieces. The, the piece that's on the screen right now is the one that my ex-husband thought I should reproduce three or four hundred times so that he could reduce alimony. So he could reduce his alimony? Yeah. Is that what you just said? Yeah. And, and, and that is part of <laughs> oh, that's, I but I mean, inspiration it, it just, coming from alimony before. But. <laughs> that's what it says to me, is that I did not want to reproduce anything 300 times. You um, wanted to continually to grow. To and evolve. Evolve, challenge yourself as an artist. Right. So functional work, as you began as a potter, soon started to take on more abstract shapes and bring you into uh, less conceptual. So let's talk about that and, and these early pieces and how how you were growing and what was happening at this time. One of the things I did to kind of, besides a lot of psychotherapy, was get on my bicycle. Now bicycling had always been a kind of a way of healing. It's like going down a hill and having that wind on your face and just the cleansing that you get from that. So I was on my bike a lot, 100 miles, at least 100 miles a week, and wow. 600 miles in the Rockies and from San Francisco and from San Diego. Um, and, and I began to see the world around me. And so it was from the bicycle that, that I, I saw nature forming. And that's where I, that was part of the moment of transition from, you know, a cylinder which has a limited dimension. And you, as you were going through these revelations in your life, um, it was very much a spiritual journey it as well. It became that. It became that. Yeah. So this piece is, is pivotal, really. It was. So, so talk about this and well, how I'm, this piece really kind of birthed a new body of work. I was challenged to do a whole bunch of Grecian kinds of things. And I was studying the Grecian uh, ge geometrical designs and, um, and the forms. And, but when I presented this as a body, and I don't think I was in graduate work school yet, to uh, my professor, he said, Lynn, this has already been done. For me, it was a challenge, you know, the foot and the arms and putting these pieces together. And, but uh, he was right, mm -hmm. you know, it had been done. Mm -hmm. And I'd found out everything I could about it and, and I was finished with it. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I began to, uh, turn away from that and probably around that time I went to Japan mm -hmm. and that's when I saw Soji Hamada working in his studio and he was this living national treasure of Japan. He died maybe two years after that but I saw him coming back to a form that he had created the morning and using a, a wooden like a rice paddle slapping the bottom of the piece to create the foot I'd never seen a paddle used uh, forming clay. And I loved the idea mm -hmm. that you could extend your hand with some tool, move yourself away from the clay itself, and act on it in ways I thought might be similar to the way that nature evolves without the thumbprint of the human. Which is a, uh, an interesting approach to clay because most potters that I uh, have been aware of and studied, you know, the connection to the clay and the connection to the earth and the tangible quality of clay, you know, and leaving the evidence of the hand, such as Otto Heino, who is one of the great potters of all time, you know, the evidence of his finger marks and so forth. This is a complete opposite approach. And s why did you feel the need to separate yourself? from the clay. Because Why? of my investigation in, in, into nature and the way that the forms evolve. And I didn't want it to 
but I was going to be evolving the form with mm -hmm. my hands. So when you say nature, um, nature's um, effect on the clay, are you referring to like um, the the erosion process, wind, um, water, the earth changing the the dynamic of of the spatial relationship? Right. So those so forms are being created naturally. In, in nature and I, I didn't, I wanted to have a form that appeared to be coming through this natural process. And this is an example. Yeah. So, and these pieces, we have a couple of examples of this work and, and help everyone understand what it is they're seeing here. So on my spiritual journey, one of the first places I went was to Taoism. And within Taoist, the, the Taoist philosophy, um, life, living forms come out of the slime. They're, a, they're an amalgamation of the slime. And I thought that was a significant thing to pay attention mm -hmm. to. The lotus blossom blooming among the mud. Yeah, yeah. So I did. And I'm, I'm using the paddles to initiate the movement of the clay and then looking within that movement for um, something that represents the idea of the life force emerging from the slime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I did small maquettes like that and then the larger pieces. This piece is about, and that's the other side of the piece, mm -hmm. um, maybe six or seven feet wide and deep and then f I think about four feet high. And these are female forms. Yeah, they are. And very erotic, really. This piece I call flower, but its real name is vulva. So there was a consciousness of that. Yeah, that was very early too. It, it was very early. And you went on to teach at Moore Park College and now you're at Cal Lutheran. Yep. Dealing with somewhat conservative colleges and religious colleges, was there ever a time where you felt a resistance or uh, were you ever worried about how this would be received by Never. your colleagues? Never. Never. No. The, uh, President Walker at Moore Park College, uh, when I asked him how he liked my exhibition, he said he didn't. <laughs> but he respected my right to do the work. And um, at Loyola, uh, at Cal Lutheran, um, I had a one-person exhibition there last year. It was very well received. And the minister of the school sent me a note about how much she loved the work. And one of the religious studies teachers bought a piece of mine from the show. Basically, my work is not, I mean, I'm teaching students right. at the university. And many of your students are here. Yeah. And you're very well respected as a teacher. I am. Yes, you are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so it was also at this point that you started to expand your um, your learning, your expanding your spirituality and learning a variety of different approaches to spirituality. So talk about that journey and how it manifests itself within the work. Okay, well, as I said, when I saw that Kentucky Fried Dinner on the wall of the gallery at CSUN when I was, a, I think, a grad, or undergraduate, I was appalled that anyone would call that art. I was, I'm sorry, I hope no one in this room did that. <laughs> <laughs> you may want to help everyone understand what you just said, because I remember this conversation, but... But it was squished under plexiglass, and there was mold, and to me it was just awful. And I understand there could be some reasons for doing that that would be, would, would be I would think, be strong reasons to do that. But I wanted an underpinning for my work that was stronger than that. Mm -hmm. And I had actually always been seeking for some sort of a spiritual place uh, in the name first of my children, you know. And we went to all kinds of churches all over. I was brought up as an Episcopalian. But I wanted a home for my children because I didn't feel adequate to teach them mm -hmm. about a relationship to God. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so in, in essential, I was actually, it turned out that I was looking for that. And uh, I uh, attended a, a spiritual retreat at the Ojai Foundation where many teachers had gathered from 
uh, Africa, from uh, Australia, from England, um, and there were several Native American teachers there. Uh, and I did my first purification lodge at the Ojai Foundation. And help us understand what a purification lodge is and what that means. Um, it's a low willow structure with a pit and red hot rocks are brought in and water is poured and the steam bathes the people. And it's from the, the cleansing of the soul, the, the reconstituting of the soul, that you can see your relationship to the Great Spirit. And so that the truths that come out of the prayers and that. And you're in a state within these sweat lodges, you know, that, that it's like a sauna in essence. It's a heated space. And you're in there for not five, ten minutes. You're in there for how long? Or? An hour and a half, two hours, depending on how many people there are and how long their prayers are. The barriers are let down mm -hmm. in the lodge. You see differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's from the confrontation with the heat. Your barriers to self-knowledge are let down and your ability to witness something bigger than yourself. An altered increased. state. An altered state. That's the one I was trying to think of. And so um, you have this epiphany, basically. And you, you realize you discovered something in that process. I felt there was a way of approaching truth through my own experience with the sacred. And so I pursued that teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, the man, one of the people at the Ojai Foundation for that retreat taught in um, La Cañada. And I went and worked with him for many years. Mm -hmm. Was apprentice for part of that time. And, um, and the, the program was one of transformation through ceremony. Mm -hmm. And this particular piece is called Goddess Awakening? Yes, the Goddess Awakens was created after I visited Palenque. And that was, a, that was a spiritual journey. That was going to where the Mayans had been and experiencing uh, the power of their power places. And uh, I took my Native American pipe up to the top of an unexcavated pyramid. And in the prayers that I did, smoking this pipe, uh, tobacco, I heard this unexcavated pyramid saying that I am the goddess sleeping and I am waiting for the women to wake up. So. A point of clarification, when you say, I heard this, it's your inner voice speaking to you? Yes. And you recognize that as a higher spirit or godlike? Yes, it God -like. comes through in the prayer. What is in the prayer? What mm -hmm. I speak in my prayer mm -hmm. is what I am, the great spirit is infusing into mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got the call. And so this body of work that evolved from that um, really was a precursor to this much larger body, the female forms. Right. Right. And you realized that you were on a path that really was life-altering. I began to lead purification lodges after many years with my teacher. I began to lead them and I led them for over 20 years. I led purification lodges and prayer dances and vision quests. And it was in that process that eventually people came who were praying to overcome abuse. Mm -hmm. That is what triggered my work with the female figure. And in fact, um, not just people, but women specifically who were abused. Yeah. And that's a very powerful contribution to the greater good. And in that process, you realize that these women really did need a lot of help and guidance. Well, what, oh, well, the door that was open to me was that there are so many abused women in our culture. There are some people that give figures of 80% mm. of the women have had some encumbrance in their life that um, in this life causes them to stop evolving into the fullness of who, they're, who they are meant to be. And as I looked at that, I began to see that, that for 4,000 years there has been an impediment to the feminine developing the truth of what it is, the full truth of what it is. And so as I do this work, I, I think that I am opening a door. I am pointing the direction 
to celebration, coming from celebration so that we can speak the truth. So before we talk about the female forms, um, let's talk about this particular piece um, and how this really became somewhat of a, a self-portrait for you. And again, was really kind of the door opening to this more um, sophisticated approach and spiritual approach to your work. And, and delving into this very deep and personal place. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll talk about the goddess relationship right. here, but before we get there, there was this, this piece, you know, yes. this piece here. Yes. So talk about this and how this really was kind of a gateway. Well, I saw these hands. It's called the Becoming Becomes. And it actually occurred at the end of another relationship and, and when, when something was opening in me to, to go even farther. I saw these um, fingers and they really surprised me. There's three fingers and a thumb on each of these, uh, each of these uh, extended hands. I hadn't known that I would do anything figurative. Mm -hmm. I was, I, I'm an abstract, I, I thought of myself as an abstract expressionist. So those mm -hmm. fingers really surprised me. And so you were at this time still doing the paddle work. Yes. And eventually, although quite exquisitely done, you just abandon this work completely. I still do it. My students will tell you. Yeah. I still do this. You do um, it as a teaching method? And I love them. I love mm -hmm. these pieces. But if they're, not, they're not my work. They're, they're something that I love to do. When but you this say was exploring what the paddle would do. And eventually that led to these more um, realistic forms. When you say this is, I'm not the one doing this, clarify that. I don't think I am the one doing this. But I don't think, and now we're getting into a question we never talked about. Yes, I know, you're throwing me. I'm sorry. Which is rare. <laughs> <laughs> Usually I know everything. <laughs> um, you're going to have to clarify that, though. All right. So I don't. I don't own this, this work. Meaning you're in a different mindset when you're doing this work? Are you talking about this specific genre, or no, you're here, referring to all your work? Any of it. I was trying to find out what the paddle would do. I, I think it's significant what is possible within the clay. So I began to see these breasts emerge. I didn't plan for those breasts to be there. Now once they got there, they were there. <laughs> um, but you see what I'm saying? I'm not, I am not insisting on what this paddle will do, what this hand will do, which turn this is going to take, which I'm not. I'm finding my way with the clay. Okay, can I challenge you on this sure. as far as, um, are you at a master craftsman level that you know the medium, you know the craft, you know the technique, you know the tools so well that you allow all of the technical skill to then be in your subconscious. So the creative side of you, the master side of you, which we all strive for as artists, is then at the surface. And then it's pure creativity that is coming out. Um, no. Huh. <laughs> okay then. That's maybe that would be, that is not my way of thinking of it. How do you From think of it? From the very beginning, I thought that the and this you called me a rebel one time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought that the limitations put on the ceramist hindered the potential to delve in the mystery. And I, and I don't. I don't put those limitations. I do not claim that I know everything there is to know about how to work with clay. My studio partners, partners are still teaching me things that I didn't get in undergraduate and graduate school. But isn't that the mark of a great, you know, we are perpetual students. <clears throat> and as artists, you're always learning. It, this I refused to join the, the craft association ah. because I didn't want to deal in what kind of tool to use for that, how many ounces or uh, grams of this to do for that. I didn't want to do that. It cluttered my brain. We were told that we had to make our forms no thicker than three-eighths of an inch. And I said, you know, whose idea is that? <laughs> <laughs> And so these clay pieces I make that weighed, you know, for a long time, 15 years, I was making the eruption of life. 
12 inches thick. Hmm. You know, I, I did not want to believe that, that, that the idea that I had was going to be limited by some mechanism. And as it turned out, this three-eighths of an inch really had to do with the fact that it was a studio and there were 400 students and their kilns had to be fired rapidly and it didn't really have to do with potential mm -hmm. or possibility. Mm -hmm. It had to do with the limitations of the circumstance. Which is a great segue into this other work because it's limitless for you and you in my observation and in studying you, there is this side of you that wants absolute freedom to be untethered and, and explore and allow all of your spiritualness, everything to, to manifest itself within your work. So there's like this drive almost, this, this just complete absorption into your work that is limitless, really. I think clay is limitless. I think that the potential for form is limitless. And, and, and for me, the discovery process, the, the moment of, of, of allowing myself to go within the mysterious possibility of what clay can do, that's what propels me. And before you got to these pieces, you did do a small body of work of figurative pieces. So we have the bear, these protection oh, yes. animals. Yes. So let's talk about these. We have um, several. These were water spouts, is that right, for a spiritual retreat? Yes, yes, the eagle and the dolphin. I don't know who you have. I did six um, protection animals for a spiritual retreat center in, um, in Santa Margarita. And why they're significant to me is that I, I had never done anything that was purely figurative, mm -hmm. except for those three fingers on mm -hmm. that one piece called The Becoming Becomes. And interestingly enough, those pieces seg segued into the female forms. Right. And it was about that time that I went to France and studied with Martine Vogel, and, the, the, and she does, she's a figurative artist. Why I did that was because I taught, I was teaching, and I felt an obligation to know something about the figure, the figure, how to achieve a figure. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got back, uh, my gardener asked me for <laughs> the um, kiln goddess that was on top of my big kiln in Northridge. I said, no, I can't give you that, but I'll make you one. So I made a female figure for him and liked it so well I couldn't give it to him. <laughs> So that, that's how I got started doing female figures. And there you go. And I gave him the one on top of the kiln. <laughs> now these pieces really became um, a reflection of your spirituality. And so talk a little bit about that and the power of these pieces and describe, let's go back those 4,000 years and pick up on the conversation that you started earlier. Okay. There is a relationship of the Native American spirituality to the original goddess worshiping cultures. And that is that we manifest the power of, of who we are in life. In the Native American spirituality, the great spirit is the amorphic energy that eventually defines itself as positive and negative. And, and comes together, but it can't see itself. So it slows itself down. This is the Native American Genesis story. It slows itself down. Now, we as humans then have the uh, opportunity within our lives to express and be our own divinity through raising our energy level. The, the um, goddess-worshipping worship, cultures had that same idea. Mm -hmm. um, they believed that sexuality was powerful, a powerful tool for raising the person to, the, to their divinity. Mm -hmm. So when I'm, these two ideas kind of married in me, when I looked at, when I recognized the struggle that so many women were having uh, to claim themselves as powerful beings. Um, and, I, and I 
believe that very often that is because they have not claimed themselves to be highly orgastic. 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 So just a heightened awareness of the physicality of being sexual. Am I, am I interpreting that correctly? Orgasm is a vibration. And, and as we learn to have higher and higher levels of orgasm, we learn to increase the level of our vibration. As we do, we reach a higher level of witnessing ourselves as sacred, closer to the divine. This is in the Native American reality, who has slowed its energy down in order for us to be manifest. So uh, how does this come out in the work? Do you have to ask? <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone's thinking, okay, orgasm here. <laughs> the big O. Well, um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we need a little explanation. So I'm seeking energy. I'm seeking energy. I'm seeking the appearance of energy, the um, a kind of internal witnessing of the possibility of fully celebrating life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly the, um, you, you made reference to some of the ancient culture yes. and, you know, the harvest and, you know, ceremonial uh, approaches to sexuality um, and the sexual act in bringing in, you know, and ensuring um, a fruitful harvest. harvest. So it is kind of interesting to make that ancient connection, um, that sacred connection. In the, in the goddess-worshipping cultures that, where they were trying to influence the, 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 uh, the growing of the plants, mm -hmm. the wealth mm -hmm. of the community, mm -hmm. um, there was an understanding that the woman was powerful in this way because mm -hmm. she created new life for human beings. Mm -hmm. So it was in that way that there was a relationship to the culture, the growth of the culture, the, the wealth of the culture, mm -hmm. to the sacredness of women's sexuality. And of course, we have evidence of this through art, through the fertility figures that have been found, these ancient figures of the goddess. So it, it is a very interesting topic. And, it, you know, of course, some of these pieces are considered to be very explicit. Mm -hmm. um, the one we are sharing with everyone is very explicit. Um, so talk a little bit, there, there certainly has been, no doubt, you have witnessed criticism to your work. Talk a little bit about, you know, how the work has been received in some, you know, areas and in, in some populations within the community. And how do you deal with that as an artist? So it's been, di it's difficult. And it's difficult because the, the idea that I am expressing has to do with the, um, difficulty we have around sexuality. Mm -hmm. We have that, I mean, I believe that the, as a culture, we have a difficulty. And as I said, it was originally really brought to my awareness through the prayers of people who had been abused. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a sign of sexual imbalance. Mm -hmm. It's energy that doesn't know what to do with itself. Mm -hmm. So yes, when I put my work out, um, I often have to explain. And sometimes I don't get an opportunity to explain. There are many people who, when they read the sexual con content, just can't stand it. Mm -hmm. There are others who love it without understanding that it has sexual content. Um, and, I, and I love that part of it too, that part where because it's expressing itself, because she is being all that she can be, she's beautiful. You're talking about how people are responding to the work and some have been critical and then how to, and how do you deal with that as an artist how do you respond you said that sometimes you don't get the opportunity to respond right does it matter to you that you don't get the opportunity I love to talk about what I do yes you do I do I love to talk <laughs> about what I do. and and I do I've, I've been all over the country teaching this concept when people come unaware to my work and have a problem with it, I often just let them go. Mm -hmm. It doesn't bother you that it's misunderstood or offended? They, no, often offended? I think they do understand it, and I'm not willing to try to um, convert mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think the work 
says what it has to say. And I've learned over time to be less and less um, vociferous. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the technical quality of these pieces. They're editions of 10 and one artist proof. Right. Originally done in clay. Yep. Okay, so talk a little bit about your process in creating these works. I, as I say, I'm a clay artist, so I'm discovering the form in clay. Um, and then there's, it's fired, there's a mold made, a wax from that mold. The wax is taken to the foundry, a shell is built around it. The wax is melted out of the shell and then liquid bronze is poured into the cavity. Mm -hmm. Then I get it back when all that shell is uh, cleared away and there are many, many, many hours of chasing the bronze, smoothing the bronze. Finishing and mm. it's it's become an important thing. I, I, I always I thought for a long time I could hire someone to do it, but as it's turned out, the the piece finishes itself in the chasing process. I'm actually mm -hmm. altering the shapes. So you don't work with interns or apprentices? No. Um, when you set out to create a figure, do you have something in your mind ready to go and you have an idea? or do you allow the clay to start guiding you? I never know. Recently, you can see that a lot of them are around in the same size range. I often start with a block of 25 pounds of clay and I paddle it, waiting for something to happen. Um, and it's when something happens, something happens, something that I respond to emerges in the event mm -hmm. of working with the clay, something that I respond to emerges. And that is when I begin to assemble other parts that go with that. Now, I always know I'm working towards a woman in full celebration of life. Mm -hmm. Very often, it's the breast that I see first. Uh, sometimes it's the butt. So uh, I don't know where I'm going. And, and that's what I love. I love to find my way. Mm -hmm. And the paddling is an interesting approach. So how, at what point do you put down the paddles and you're actually sculpting with your hands? Um, when the paddles re stop being useful in discovering the form, you know, and usually it's after, sometime after I've identified something very significant and then I have to work with the rest of it. Mm -hmm. What's gonna work with that part? Um, you name them all? Yes, this is Cassiopeia. And um, a lot of the names go back to ancient figures and historic figures. So um, how do you come up with the name? How do you know, you know, do they reveal themselves to you and you say, oh, that, that is whomever? Um, I just kind of keep a catalog of names in my head. Sometimes I write them down. You know, when I hear something, I hear a name. And it's mostly the sound of the name. It doesn't have anything to do with the historic reference so. reference to ah. the name. This is the uh, this is uh, Desdemona. Desdemona. But see, I just love the the sound of that yeah. that name, and and the sound of it to me has the feeling of the dyna the dynamic of the of the piece. And but the so. character Desdemona, a very tragic character in Shakespeare, care. who's strangled by her husband, right? Right. I'm sorry you have that <laughs> association. <laughs> but um, it, is there a consciousness of the name Desdemona having this reference, this no. very famous reference? No, no. Which goes I back mean, well, to abuse how we can... and no. sexuality. Thank you. No. Well, maybe I should look more closely. <laughs> did, did you ever read? Um, Shakespeare's Desdemona? I've heard it. Mm. What, what is, it's the play, not it's called not, Desdemona. It's not called, what it's play called is it? A, 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 a fellow, yeah. that's right. It's the sound of the name, not the historical quality at all. Mm. It's the, the name, and I'm sorry, I mean, maybe I should pay more attention to it. This is Morning Glory. I have Dulcinea, Cassiopeia, I have um, Cleopatra, and then I have Magnolia and uh, Angel Veep. Angel Veep is named Veep because Veep is healing my body right now. What does that mean? Veep is her name. She's uh, Dutch. What does it mean that she's healing your body? She's helping me with arthritis. In, and so she's my angel. And at the time that she began to work on me, I was working on that piece, Angel Veep. Ah. 
And um, so, got that so name. that physical person is helping you. In that physical. case, <laughs> the piece was She's definitely. Be clear. Yeah. In that case, the piece was definitely an angel. It's the one next to Morning Glory. Definitely an angel. And she became Veep because of the woman that was working yeah. on me. God. That's <laughs> Sorry. <interesting>. That's okay. <laughs> it's, there's so many layers to your work. Uh, you know, there's a complexity um, because of the complexity of you as a human being. And, and I mean that not in a pejorative way. I mean that very flattering because you as an artist, it's like every ounce of your being is absorbed in creativity. You know, it's like everything in you, you, you know, you're, you're so soulful and it shows in the work. I love them. I love these girls. I really do. They, and I don't own them at all, as I said to you. I don't know where they come from or how they got there, but I really value the opportunity I've had to be this vehicle, mm -hmm. to be the one that does this work. What advice do you have for students? Oh, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of Don't what? be afraid of the unknown, what you don't understand. Don't be afraid of it. Keep moving. Yeah. Fear can be pretty paralyzing. Absolutely. The movement in these works, I know you are a drummer, and that's an important part of your spiritual retreats. It is. And it's interesting that the drumming mirrors the paddling. Yes, so that's yeah. interesting. I hadn't noticed it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so talk a little bit about that. The drum is an, a vibration, if you notice. And it's one of the ways of approaching the sacred. And singing is, is a vibration, is, is raising your vibratory level. It's a way of approaching the sacred. Um, in the uh, dances that I've been part of for many, many years, the drum is the catalyzer of the energy. Mm -hmm. So all of the uh, prayers, and each step in the Native American, each step is a prayer. And um, the drum generates the, the dance. I led the drum team for five years. The drum team? Yeah, there were, there were five, six, seven of us. And so this movement, this kind of dance quality in your work, um, again, you know, this from what you practice in everyday life mirrors your art. So, well, I've never told you the story about dance in my life. The real story about dance is that there's a place called Dance Home in Santa Monica. And um, as I was recovering from my divorce and growing into a new aspect of myself, I went to dance home as many as um, two nights a week for many, many years. Dance home is a place where the dance comes through you in some spontaneous way. <clears throat> and I learned about my dance that way. Now I think about life as the dance, the dance that we are engaged in uh, as a way of revealing ourselves to ourselves. And so if my girls feel like they, you know, look as if they're dancing, it's a way of um, expressing the highest vibration of who we are. That's the dance. Okay. And when you refer to that, you go back to the orgasmic aspect of it. That's the highest when you refer to that, that is the highest level. The highest vibration that we're capable of as human beings is in the highest level of our orgasm. And these other things, dance, sing, drum, pray, those are also raising our vibration. And is a spiritual practice for you? Yes. Yes, very much so. Life is a spiritual practice. Yes. We are moving towards knowledge of ourself in the life that we're in contributing from the truth of who we are. Now you also have created very male forms, but still in the feminine, I such have? as this piece. <laughs> it's very phallic. Oh, <laughs> last I checked. We're looking at <laughs> <laughs> the city of Ventura did not want, that's Amazon Warrior, by the way. 
And she's Amazon warrior because she's missing a breast. She happens to be missing her left breast, which would not exactly be appropriate, but I couldn't well, help it. That's how it happened. The, the Amazon women and the, your reference to one breast, because right. everyone they, may they, not know. They used a bow and arrow and they cut off a breast so that they could do it, so that they could use their bow and arrow. Mm -hmm. But it was the right breast. But I mean, I couldn't help it. I'd already done it. She was a left-handed Amazon. <laughs> but to me, she's not a male figure. But, <laughs> but I, a, under, I sort of understand why people think she's somewhat phallic, but she's not to me. <laughs> <laughs> this is the piece the city bought. This is a Madeline. And the opening for that is, uh, let's see, Thursday night right. is the reception. Six to eight. Six to at eight. City Hall. And that's the new acquisitions for mm -hmm. the city municipal art mm -hmm. collection. Congratulations. Thank you. It's mm -hmm. very exciting. So it'll be permanent on permanent display. Second floor. And it's the first figurative piece, I believe, uh, nude figure that they've acquired. Is it? Which they were very careful which piece. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine why. <laughs> well, good for them. Because it's a, it's a courageous move because, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people share your views that as far as uh, nudity and, you know, the comfort level with figurative work in our society and Ventura being pretty conservative in that regard, um, you're, you're breaking ground, really. S Delise Sindelar curated me into a show when she was still with um, Natalie's. Natalie's at Natalie's Threads in their first building. And uh, so she's been an ally. She mm -hmm. really has. Mm -hmm. She likes my work and she's been an ally. And, and it's selected by committee? Yeah. Yeah. Well, fabulous. Well, hopefully um, a lot of our supporters will be there for that reception. I'm planning on being there. Oh, good. It's very exciting. Good. Great. Well, what's next? What's the next body of work for you? I wanted, can I speak to that slide? Yeah, you bet. That, was a, that is taken um, at the CIIS, uh, California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, which is a, a graduate school for pursuing alternative religions, among other things, uh, psychology, um, mythology. Um, but I was so delighted to have that show there because, mm -hmm. um, well, I just respect what they're doing and they, they did a wonderful job with my work mm, there. That's fabulous. Yeah. Um, oh, you won the Paul Manship Award last I, year. I did. It which is very prestigious. Yes. Tell us about that. It's uh, Lorelei Wolf in New York um, has a competition, and I entered it and won the prize. And of course, Paul Manship was one of the great sculptors of the 20th century, and very prestigious award. Congratulations yeah. on you. that. Yes. Um, so, what's your next big exhibition? Have, do you have one planned? Yes, um, Mesa, Arizona has uh, requested three girls, Desiree, Penelope's not here tonight, and Morning Glory, uh, for a exhibition um, in downtown Mesa. It's an, ex it's an outdoor exhibition. Mm. And three pieces are going to Nice. Um, and who they are, I can't remember right now. That's okay. I hope I have it written down someplace. <laughs> and how did you end up doing this Nice exhibition? Um, 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 a friend who is an artist gave me um, the information online mm -hmm. of how to contact them. I'm having a little difficulty because is there anyone here that speaks French? It's, I, I'm, I'm having to transmit all of the information to my friend in um, Spokane who teaches French, or who speaks French. She's Canadian French. And I'm a little uncertain of how this is all unfolding. But well, Lydia hopefully. can help you, okay. our learning to see coordinator. She's oh, good. French. Oh, good. Um, you, I do want to um, just very quickly, because we're running short on time, but um, talk about the fact that you do participate in juried exhibition and fairs. and. Um, which is becoming more and more popular and more prestigious these days with fine artists. Mm -hmm. um, so talk about that process. It's been very important. Yes. I sell most of my work that way. Outside of our community. Yeah, I sell my, I, I have sold one, two pieces, two pieces uh, in this community. One of the uh, owners is here tonight. But a, a number of years ago, um, a gallery in Carmel that was showing my work suggested this to me. 
uh, they had um, done festivals for many years. Now, up until that time, I thought of festival as like the neighborhood recreation, you know, go put your pots out on the lawn and somebody will buy something. And I wasn't interested in denigrating my girls to this mm -hmm. kind of experience. But when she opened the door, I looked in and there was, and there are rating systems um, that tell you, you know, which are the best uh, festivals. And so I've been applying and participating in wonderful, wonderful art experiences all, all around the country. All around the country. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, good luck to you. Thank you. We want to thank you for being here. Thank just, you oh, for thank this wonderful you, opportunity. Thank you, Lynn. You yeah. were fabulous. I'm so glad.